Hi, everybody. This is Bob Surridge. And my role here is just to say uh, good evening to everyone and introduce Hello. the Southport Storyteller. And that's that's Mike, Mike Royal. And Mike, Hello, what are you going to talk to us about tonight? Uh, I call it a, a Southport Christmas memory. I thought, you know, just a few days here before Christmas, we would continue talking about Christmas. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, you know, some things that happened to me personally. And um, I'm also going to involve a little bit of community Christmas, you know, things that we enjoyed at Christmas right. time growing up in Southport. I tell you, did, did you see the, uh, well, you saw it because you were part of it, the old fashioned uh, Southport old fashioned Christmas? I did. It was very good. I especially enjoyed hearing Ginger uh, relate to uh, and tell us about the Holiday House and uh, her, her mother-in-law, Margaret Harper. And my mother worked closely with Margaret Harper on some of those as well. And I enjoyed Pat's uh, reading of Susie Carson's uh, Christmas from back in the days of the Great Depression. And I especially enjoyed hearing Charles talk about his memories of uh, Christmases in Southport, uh, particularly related to the fire truck, the, you know, the fire station. And, you know, he's like, like you said, he's fourth generation fire department. And um, hearing the stories of the, of Santa coming into town on the back of the fire truck. You know, I don't, when, when I videoed that, he, and I'm not sure he said it on the, on the tape, but what he said was he didn't, he personally really didn't, didn't care if Santa Claus was on the fire truck. He wanted to be on the top of the fire truck. And that was, yeah, that, that, that makes was the sense. Yeah. And now he's the fire chief, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't remember getting to ride on the fire truck, but I do remember Santa coming into town on the back of the fire truck with me standing on the sidewalk somewhere downtown as Santa made the turn on Moore Street and threw candy canes out from his bag and the kids would be grabbing the candy canes. Now, before you get started, Mike, I want uh, I want to get your opinion on what do you think of my my uh, my reindeer sweater? <laughs> well, that's actually a very nice looking sweater, so <laughs> it doesn't actually qualify for one of those ugly Christmas yeah, well, sweaters. <laughs> it's, it's ugly enough that don't tell my wife I'm wearing it, okay? Okay, okay. <laughs> well, maybe that's me she, she's thinking about. But anyway, <laughs> it's Christmas. Well, and so it's time time to hear your, your Christmas story. Okay, I'll get started. Uh, I call this a Southport Christmas memory. And again, I'm going to write this from the perspective of the old man uh, looking back through the eyes of his boyhood eyes of his childhood. <clears throat> the old man was seated in his favorite chair a chair that had seen its better days so long ago that the old man could hardly remember how it came to be with him. Yet, somehow, now it was. After all these years, his rough and rumpled frame found nothing else capable of providing such comfort. He compares this feeling to the ancient slippers he refuses to throw away. They still soothe his tired feet though, and that's why, they, why he hangs on to those old slippers. As his thoughts linger and as he notices the chill of the evening air, he recalls the wonderful silver rays of winter evenings, those of a boy in a town where everybody knew his name <clears throat> and he knew theirs. His childhood home was a place born of mother nature and kissed by God a natural beauty. Hard-working families lived in this little town. They raised their children on oyster dressing and clam chowder broth. Today, his late evening chill is carried by the breezes as a nip in the air, a sure sign that the season had changed. Even the sunlight landed on his little part of the earth differently. The chill in the air, 
the smell of freshly cut cedar, all colluded to tempt his brain to search for fond memories of days gone by. It was the voice of Johnny Mathis that made him remember the season. <clears throat> a season of his youth as the song played out over the radio and in the notes of Oh Holy Night, a Christmas tune, like many he recalled being played on an ancient family record player, the vinyl disc still crackling in his head now as he remembers it, the spinning of the turntable and the stylus skipped over the scratches, Johnny Mathis's voice sounding warm as it overwhelmed the crackling to the point it became unnoticeable. The old man always loved the memories and the magic of Christmas, especially in the music of his childhood. Singers like Bing Crosby with his White Christmas, you know, the one that goes, I'm dreaming of a white, that one. <laughs> and Perry Como, which is who his parents dearly love, all crooning away with every circuit of the black disc. Christmas is for families, friends, and children. It was an enchanted special time for our little town. It was a time to rejoice and share in the faith of a small child born to us in a little town known as Bethlehem. All those Christmas plays and cantatas at Trinity United Methodist Church were wrapped and saved in the distant reaches of the old man's mind. There were special music programs at Southport High School, and they all led to a Southport citywide celebration of Christmas, a community celebration of what Christmas meant and all those words that were written in that holy book. The town folk rejoiced in the season together. The old man remembers them all, Yet now, they blend together, and although not in order, they still capture the feeling and the joy that was shared. It was a time of innocence, almost void, of what is now, it's what we now call high technology. These were the early years, even before the television came. When television came, it was a black and white world reduced to just one television station, WECT, out of Wilmington. All around the little village, adults and children alike participated in those festive celebrations. The old man recalls a youthful performance at a Christmas program at Trinity United Methodist Church. And a particular part that he had played, these many years later, the tune is still fresh in his head along with its lyrics. He could step in and perform it even now. I said to sheep with the curly horn, I gave him my wool on Christmas morning. Like a jingle, it is still with him. That part, the, two, the old man remembers the last rehearsal for the boy before their real- Michael. Unmute your phone. Unmute. Unmute yourself. How did that happen? I made a mistake. Okay. All right. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Do I need to go Christmas. back? Forgive me. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. So I'm telling you about a time when I'm probably about eight years old. And I'm just going to kind of recap a little bit. And I'm doing a Christmas play at Trinity United Methodist Church. And a teacher from the school who, is also, who also went to Trinity is doing, you know, is preparing us all to do this play. So I'm doing a rehearsal. And my part was, I just had one little part. I said to sheep with the curly horn, I gave him my wool on Christmas morn. Well, we were preparing to do, you know, this is the rehearsal um, for the boy before their Christmas service. Mrs. Lingle had thoroughly gone over his part, and he had done well. He had this one covered. As he left Trinity United Methodist Church that day, his father, who rarely uh, picked him up, 
had come to the church to give him a ride home that day. As the boy hopped into his dad's car, he began to sing, and loudly, I might add, the Marines hymn, not the sheep with the curly horn. So he started blaring out from the halls of Montezuma, and he was singing away, and his father looked at him and asked, shouldn't you be practicing your part? The boy agreed and switched his brain to pull up the sheep with the curly horn tune. Well, it was gone. All the boy could pull up and all his brain could find was the Marines hymn. The only thing he could confidently remember now was the Marines hymn. A sudden feeling of doom crept into the pit of his stomach as he visualized a failed performance in church. He could not recall the tune or the words. He asked his father to take him back to the church in hopes that Mrs. Lingle would still be there. She was. They walked into the church and then as, as his father explained the singing of the Marines hymn and how it had caused the boy to forget his new part, Mrs. Lingle smiled as though she had seen this type of crisis before. Mrs. Lingle led the boy over to the piano where she tapped out his notes and sang his words for him. It all rushed back to the boy as he remembered as he remembered it all now with confidence. He boldly sang, I said the sheep with the curly horn, I gave him my wool on Christmas morn. As the boy and his father were leaving, Mrs. Lingle said, no more Marines hymn until after our Christmas service. The boy and his father were all smiles as they nodded in agreement. He was careful to practice just his part. When the evening arrived, the boy boldly blasted the congregation with the curly horn sheep and managed to hit every note right on key. As he stared out into the congregation, the folks were all smiles, smiles of sincerity, of known joy, of remembrance, and most of all of love. But there on a back pew sat his father, a man who never came to church was sitting there with the most joyous smile of all. All around town were the signs of the season. His family would always make a trip around town to see the lights and the decorations. The Baptist church always had a large nativity scene. Homes were festively decorated and since we rarely got any snow, the bright lights and decor were a joyful substitute. In those early years, Southport would string multicolored lights down House Street and parts of Moore Street. These lights were large, like a lamp style light bulb, and they came in red, blue, green, and yellow. The city crews would spend a few days every year stringing them in a zigzag pattern across Howe and Moore Street. The memory of these lights is special because of their simplicity just a string of bare bulbs and Bakelite sockets. That's all we got, and, that's, and that was enough, and that's all we needed. It was more than enough to seed, the, seed a kid's memory of wonderment. Even today, as the old man visualizes the memory, its simplicity is what makes it so special. The view was spectacular, starting somewhere near the town water tower the lights in all their many colors zigzagged their way all the way down the street to the river's edge. At the river's edge, they were greeted most years by a brightly lit cedar tree. The sight from the water tower looking down to the river was a sight to see. All the different colors and all the zigzagging strings blended into a matrix of wonder, a fine memory for the old man. Santa came to town too, riding prominently on the back of a city fire truck. Horns were blaring and lights were flashing as Santa tossed out candy canes and other delights while asking the kids to see him at the fire station. All the kids would gather at the fire station to sit on Santa's knee. The boy once told his parents after talking to Santa 
that Santa's voice sounded a lot like Foxy Howard, but his parents assured him he was mistaken. At home on Christmas Eve, the boy would leave Santa a glass of milk and a cookie, only to wake the next morning to find the milk gone and a single bite taken out of the cookie. The boy remembers the magic of the moment, that the evidence of Santa was right there before him in the half-eaten cookie. Santa had been there. Who else bit that cookie? There, under the tree, were all the gifts and dreams of a child's life, the things, the things that became his to love and enjoy as they were given in love and joy. One year, the boy got a blue and chrome five-speed swim bicycle, a well-known bicycle by now, as the boy, or I mean the old man, writes these words. He has shared many stories of his blue and chrome five-speed swim bicycle before. But all around town, on Christmas morning, the kids emerged from their homes riding new bicycles, playing with new balls, dolls, and wagons. The boy, he was last seen riding a blue and chrome five-speed swim bicycle as he circled the cedar bench. And he said, Merry Christmas to all. The old man yelled that, or was that the boy? <laughs> and that's it. And Merry Christmas to everyone. Thank you, Mike. That was that was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank I'm you. I'm not showing my face, but um, I'm Jane Martin, and I loved that. Thank I, you, Jane. I had forgotten um, lights strung across the road, the, the like Main Street, and I had forgotten all about that till you mentioned that. Yeah. And then my, I'm from High Point, and and we used to have lights strung across like that. But that was completely done. Thank you. Thank you very. I thank you very much, and that is one of my favorite memories. And I mentioned that just a bare bulb and bakelite sockets, and I say bakelite because you know that was a material before plastic that they used to make sockets out of, and yeah. so that kind of added to the 1950s, early 60s flair of of how they decorated the street. And the zigzag pattern, watching it as it went down to the river, it really was quite something to see. My memories go back to the 40s, where we got a tree just a week before Christmas and nailed two boards. That's hold, right. You know, uh, uh, and I remember one time Daddy saying he had to pay a dollar for that tree. And, uh, that was, yes. Now, I remember oh, my God. father... Yeah, I remember my father nailing two boards to the trees. And and that's another thing. I was listening to Charles Drew talk about his Christmas experiences. And we had some similar ones as well. And one was going out Christmas tree hunting. Yeah. You know, we'd go out and find some cedar trees. And um, Charles mentioned a couple of places that he went. But I remember going out to where Midway Road is, and now they have the new bridge going to Oak Island there. But before all that, there was a dirt road that ran over to the Intercoastal Waterway. And man, you could get close to the Intercoastal Waterway down that dirt road, and there was a bunch of beautiful cedar trees that could be used as uh, Christmas trees. And that's where we used to go Christmas tree hunting, is what we called it. Hey, Mike, we got a couple of comments from, from Facebook. Um, okay. Stephen Todd Holt says, thanks, Mike. Uh, Rusty Drew, Mike, we want you to tell the story about Jimmy Buffett's brother. <laughs> yeah, um, that one is, uh, I'm trying to remember how, I, I remember the joke that Rusty is talking about, and I think I called it, oh, so a period of time, I was a radio DJ out of Shalot just for a brief period of time. And we played a lot of beach music. And uh, I used to joke around and said, Jimmy Buffett's brother was in town playing just down the street. His name is, is Lunch Buffett. 
<laughs> you know, lunch buffet, lunch buffet. So that's what Rusty is referring to. And and Stephen Stephen Holt, Chronicles of Indiana Jones's exclusive. Yeah, yeah, he does the. Uh, Stephen always does. So Stephen is my guy on Facebook that I enjoy because you know remember back when we could go into the grocery store and maybe they're still there. The National Enquirer. Would, have, would be sitting there and it would be the aliens had landed and stuff like that. Stephen likes to post stuff like that. And he finds these old, they look like the old National Enquirer newspaper cover pages, you know. And I get a kick out of it. It's kind of nostalgic for me. Uh, and he, he'll post something like that. And he'll refer to himself sometimes as the Indiana Joneser. <laughs> Uh, you need to get some of these guys on the air with you so we can, uh, you know, hear, I think, hear all yeah. your secrets. I think we want to do that, and but we won't be telling any secrets. <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the things that I didn't mention was a lot of these Christmas programs happened at the school, our, our local school, Southport High School. And I can remember participating in a junior high glee club and practicing all these Christmas tunes and learning to uh, learning to sing a part. Uh, and a, a fellow by the name of Mr. Frank uh, was our conductor, and he was accompanied by Mrs. Annie Francis on piano. And I can remember the first time I tried out for his glee club, you know, in preparation to sing some of these Christmas tunes. He ran us up the scales to see if we were going to be alto, soprano, or wherever we were going to be. And so I'm like a 12, 13-year-old kid. And so I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to sing all the way up there as high as I can go. And um, I end up over in the soprano section. And I look, <laughs> and I look, and all my buddies, I'm the only boy in the soprano section. And I'm like, I'm going, why did I sing so high up the scale? You know, so it took me a few weeks. I couldn't go to Mr. Frank right, right away. He sort of knew what was up. And I go, you know, I think my voice is starting to change, Mr. Frank. I need to go back down to the altos, at least to the altos. <laughs> yeah, all my buddies sitting over there kind of like, you know, laughing at me over there in the soprano section. You know, I can, so some of those parts that I learned in junior high school, I can remember singing. I mean, I don't read notes in music, but I, I understand, you know, ba bass line, you know, and uh, treble. And I can follow the notes up and down on the scale. I know, you know, I can follow them up and down. I just can't read notes. But some of those parts that I remembered from those days, I can still pull them out, you know, if I had to sing a tune. Of course, I, you know, I wouldn't do that now, Bob, so don't ask. <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't, but yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for me? So I try to relate that story based on, you know, my experiences of growing up in Southport. And, you know, it's kind of like I was telling Bob earlier, when I, when I go back and I look at some of these memories of my childhood, you know, I might be the last generation that goes back and looks at his childhood photographs and they're, and they're still in black and white, you know, because color film was not uh, that prevalent yet. And, you know, in terms of maybe affordability, I don't know, it was probably around, uh, but it didn't really start showing up till sometime in the mid 60s. So when I go and I look at me sitting in my red fire truck you know, I know it's red because I remember it, but it's a, in a black and white photo. Or my green army Jeep, which I, I got. And by the way, these are also metal. They're not plastic. You know, so back in those days in the late 50s and early 60s, you could still get metal, you know, metal cars and trucks, which I think is wonderful. I wish I still had them today. 
in my day, we don't, I don't have pictures of inside any of our houses because uh, we didn't have flash cameras until I got to about junior high. Right, right. So, was, so I have no pictures of the home I, I lived in, you know, when I was young, inside pictures. I didn't even think about that. That's right. <laughs> Couple more comments on fa Facebook. Uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Kenny Spencer says, "I spent most Christmas mornings running over to your house, to your parents' house, showing you all Santa brought me." <laughs> yeah, she's such a sweet one. I, you know, she she would stand in her. I would, you know, I'm like a senior in high school, and she's like I don't know five years old, I guess. And she would stand at her sliding glass doors, and anytime she saw me pull in the yard, she'd go, "Mike, Mike," wanting me to come visit her. <laughs> we lived across the street from her family, and wonderful years, good neighbors, wonderful people, nothing but good times and good memories. Yeah. Um, Daniel Swan says it's uh, Mr. James Frank. Yeah, I wanted to say James Frank, but I was afraid I was wrong. Thank you, Danny. Danny's my cousin, my cousin, by the way. William, William uh, Woodring. Merry Christmas, Mike. Remember, lost the screen. Same going? to you. Same to you, Bill. Yeah, uh, let me get his whole, whole message. I lost it there for a moment. One of the first jobs I had out of high school, graduating from South Brunswick High School, Bill was already there. He was a year ahead of me, I believe, but he was working at DuPont in Leland. And I went to work there, and a lot of times Bill and I would uh, carpool together. We both worked at DuPont. Mike, did a good. I was really enjoyed that this this evening, and um, you know, it's, 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 it'll be on on Facebook um, the recording, so other folks can watch it. And it really fits into the to the theme we've been we've been doing with the starting with the city city's Winterfest program, and then the S historical society's contribution was the old-fashioned Southport Christmas, which, and you mentioned, mentioned many parts of that, but we're, yeah. we're repeating those on, on Facebook, the different uh, segments. And I, I know I have you, you scheduled for Christmas Eve to do uh, um, you know, the clip about you doing the Smithville Christmas uh, poem. Okay. So, folks look forward to, forward to that. Well, uh, you know, to those that haven't, that haven't had a chance to view it, they should go check it out. I really enjoyed it, particularly listening to Ginger talk about the Holiday House and some of her family history. And like I mentioned earlier, Pat Kirkman talking about Susie Carson's Depression Era Christmas and Charles Drew talking about riding in the fire truck. Yeah, I think the other one was uh, Travis Gilbert. Who's, Travis, uh, I forgot about Travis. Yeah, the young fellow is the educator over on, on the Bald Head Island, Bald Head Island found, Foundation. And he yeah. takes the, Captain, the, the book about Captain Charlie and there's a, there's a couple pages in there about Christmas celebration, the Lightkeepers Christmas celebration uh, in 19, 1911. And that, he did so you know Captain, Captain Charlie's my great grandfather, right? So. And so Travis ended up knowing more about my family Christmas than I knew. So I, I must I must have missed those pages in the book. He did a good job. He did. He did. All right. And, and Pamela, thank you for applauding my sweater. Hey, hey thank you. <laughs> thank you. And Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs>